Hey guys, Winston at Carbide3D here. My office is a dump, not in the sense that it's an unpleasant place to be, but more because people will just drop stuff off here that they don't want or don't know what to do with. Recently, I ended up with some material samples because of that. One was a sheet of mirrored acrylic, the other was polycarbonate with a silvered coating like what you might find in a two-way mirror. Individually, I couldn't think of anything interesting to make with them, but together I realized that they could be used to make an infinity mirror. So in the spirit of recycling, that's what I set out to do. Now, the design of an infinity mirror isn't all that complicated. Fundamentally, it's just two mirrors that trap light while letting a little bit of it escape. A light source between these two layers will leak out a little bit of light with each reflected bounce between the mirrors. All you need to do is hold these pieces in place. A structure like a picture frame or a shadow box would do the trick. Now, there are literally hundreds of ways you can make a frame like this, but because I'm a terrible woodworker, my first and only thought was to do this on a CNC. Here's how I designed my frame. I first modeled a trapezoidal prism. Since I was going to make a square mirror, this piece would form a quarter of my frame. Within this, I cut slots for my mirrors. The acrylic mirror was about 6mm thick, and the polycarbonate was 3mm. Since I would be cutting these slots with an eighth inch end mill though, there was no point modeling something thinner than that width. I dimensioned these slots so they would be 0.398 inches apart. I probably should have just set it to 0.4, but in a moment of weakness I dimensioned this in metric. Most LED strips are 10mm wide, so I set my gap for that width plus a tiny bit of margin. I extruded these profiles as cuts and visualized the completed frame by creating a circular pattern of these pieces around the origin. So far so good, and in fact I could have stopped here. This frame wouldn't be very strong if you glued it together as is, but you could easily reinforce it with splines. But I said before, I'm not a woodworker, so I took this as an opportunity to try some very rudimentary CNC joinery experiments. By creating a finger on one side and a slot on the other, I could interlock the walls of my frame and provide more surface area for glue to bond them together. Sort of like a bastardized box joint. Because you can't cut sharp corners like this on a 3-axis machine, I had to round over all the vertices around my finger and also all the corresponding features on the slot side. There are more efficient ways to make a sturdy frame, but I wanted to come up with something I could do in a single setup using one end mill. I'd rather spend 10 minutes in front of Fusion than 10 minutes with power tools in the shop. Another thing I'll note is that you could model this in a way that would allow the frame to have reflection symmetry. You would just have to make two different versions of this frame, one with only fingers and one with only slots. In the manufacturing workspace, I created a setup that assumed my frame segment would be completely surrounded by material on all sides. The stock thickness was half an inch. I started with a 3D pocketing toolpath. 10,000 RPM, 60 inches per minute, and a 0.04 inch step down. This is a fairly aggressive but safe set of parameters for the Nomad. On the Shapeoko, you can easily bump up both RPM and feed rate by about 50%. This toolpath is constrained to keep the end mill in the immediate vicinity of the part. After this toolpath, I would use a contour toolpath to clean up the slots. Since the slot for the 3mm polycarbonate was too thin to be picked up by the pocketing toolpath, I'll machine this out by applying a 2D contour to one side of the slot. I'll use this same toolpath to clean up the walls of the slot meant for the acrylic sheet. To finish the outer walls of the frame segment and ensure that it's fully cut out, I'll use a 2D contour toolpath referencing the outline of the part around the bottom. And then, just to get the smoothest possible surface finish, I'll go around the perimeter one more time at a slower feed rate and in one step down. You could consider this a spring pass. And then to define the sloped faces of my frame's interlocking elements, I used some parallel toolpaths. And by the way, I'm using a single tool for all of this, an eighth inch down cutting end mill. Because this geometry is purely horizontal, vertical, or downhill, there aren't any U-shaped crevices that the cutter can't dip into, I can get away with not using a ball end mill. That's my toolpathing in a nutshell, so let's see it in action. I first cut out an appropriate sized chunk of bamboo on the shape oko. Yes, this is a reject nomad side panel, so this is technically going to be a bit of CNC cannibalism. Children, avert your eyes. Using double-sided tape, I'll stick this slab of bamboo on the nomad and start running my toolpaths. Since I'm using a downcutting end mill, the workpiece will be pressed down against the table, helping to keep it in position instead of ripping it off the bed. Theoretically, this should have been a drama-free experience. My speeds and feeds seem to be doing quite well, but every now and then, the unexpected happens. In this case, some of the remnants from my stock broke loose and jammed the cutter and stalled the spindle. That little bit of dislodged stock took the brunt of the impact though, and my frame wasn't damaged. 
I reran my toolpaths with the roughing operations for the first three parts removed from the G-code file. If you've never looked inside a G-code file, it can look a bit like matrix code, a never-ending stream of alphanumeric characters. Fortunately, Fusion 360 comments the code with the names of each toolpath so you can identify which section does what. If I delete the first three instances of my roughing toolpath, I can skip them. I just need to make sure that some of the unique lines that run at the beginning of program execution aren't deleted as well. These include the tool change command, M6, turning on the spindle, and the G54 command which ensures that you're at a safe height before the machine repositions over the start of a cut. With this new shortened program, I completed the remaining toolpaths. There was a small amount of chip out on some of the edges of my pieces since bamboo, even stabilized in plywood form, has some fairly coarse grain structure. But for a proof of concept piece, this really didn't bother me. The frame components were a little tight initially since I didn't model or program any clearance between the fingers, but a little light sanding was able to sort that out. The next step was to cut out my polycarbonate mirror. This was just a contour toolpath around a square, really nothing to it. Next was the acrylic mirror, and here things started out well, but as the cut got deeper and deeper, something seemed off. I was getting really fluffy chips that weren't evacuating the cuts well, and as soon as I started to see them clumping up on the end mill, I hit pause. If you let that ball of melted acrylic keep spinning on top of the material, you're gonna see and feel a really nasty surface finish around the edges. I used some cutting pliers to gently break off the pieces of acrylic and try and salvage the tool and program. You can usually be pretty rough with 8th inch or larger end mills, but this 2mm single flute is much more fragile. You have to be super conscious to never twist or push laterally on a clot like this. And even then, my success rate for clearing these up is only about 66%. I wasn't sure what was going wrong here since this was a recipe I'd used before. For 2mm and 16th inch end mills, I usually feel pretty safe around 16 to 18,000 RPM. But out of an abundance of caution, I backed the RPMs down to about 14,000 without adjusting the feed rate. I was hoping that by forming larger chips with each revolution of the cutter, it would help reduce the tendency of the acrylic to melt. I resumed the program and crossed my fingers, but a couple minutes later I could see an annoying little wisp of acrylic shaving start to coalesce into another blob on the end mill. This time I was not so lucky in clearing it off the end mill. In hindsight, using a lighter or heat gun might have helped the acrylic to release more easily, but I was in more of a brute force mood that night. With this end mill a lost cause, I had to abort the execution of the program so I could install a new tool. This time I dropped the RPMs all the way down to 10,000. Since I had cut more than halfway through the acrylic, I could just run the toolpath from my polycarbonate mirror since that was the same shape, just thinner. That would save me a couple minutes of air cutting. And finally, I had the acrylic mirror cut out. Be careful when you're working with this stuff by the way, if you use a double-sided tape that's too strong, like carpet tape, you risk damaging the reflective backing if you put that side on the bottom. I have a pretty good feel for the tape I'm using, but even then I pried my mirrors off the table as gently as I could. It wasn't until much later that night, right before bed for me, that I realized the likely cause of my poor experience cutting acrylic. Most commercially available acrylic comes in two varieties, cast and extruded. Extruded acrylic is generally cheaper, and it cuts easier with a laser. It's also a little softer and has a lower melting point than cast acrylic. Of the dozen or so mirrored acrylic vendors I could find with a quick Google search, about half of them said they were made from extruded acrylic. The other half just said acrylic. None of them ever explicitly said they were made from cast acrylic. If you're going to cut acrylic, definitely give preference to the cast variety. Not only will it hold up to milling a lot better, but because it's harder than extruded acrylic, it will be more scratch resistant, which is ideal if you're using it as a window or viewport. Cast acrylic was what our speeds and feeds data was developed on. If you're stuck with extruded acrylic or mystery acrylic like I was using, bring down your RPMs and even consider reducing your depth of cut and trading it for feed rate. Big shavings of acrylic are less melt prone than small chips or dust. Anyhow, back to the project. From this point on, it was just a matter of integrating the parts, and I'll skim over that quickly since my design was pretty terrible and made assembly quite tedious. After installing three quarters of my LEDs, I had to painstakingly solder on wires that I ran through two manually drilled holes. 
I had left almost no room to run wiring because that was kind of an afterthought for me. I then globbed on some E6000 over the wires as sort of a poor man's potting compound. And I really didn't have a good way to close up the frame with the mirrors in place while simultaneously attaching the last side of the LED strips, so I sort of just awkwardly shoved everything inside. And what do you know, it actually works. And because these are RGB LEDs, this infinity mirror is extra mesmerizing. I hope you all found this roundabout journey of making an infinity mirror either interesting or educational. If so, give us a thumbs up. If not, leave a civil comment below about what kind of content you want to see on this channel. Do you prefer longer projects, shorter theory videos, product announcements and updates? All of the above? Let us know. And for those of you who aren't quite ready for Fusion 360's workflow, don't worry because we're cooking up some more Carbide Create content as well. Good luck and have fun machining, folks.